Today we're going to talk about the tax zombies. Hoping you guys can help me defeat the tax zombies. I need some help in that. Uh, and before we get started though, um, anytime I talk about the law or taxes, I like to check in with how we feel. Uh, it's more important than, than we realize, because if we don't acknowledge how we're feeling about a subject, it's hard to get to an empowered place and, and learn with it. So when you think about the tax law, dealing with your taxes, personal or business, how does it make you guys feel? You can type it in the chat, shout it out, whatever, whatever makes you comfortable. Nervous, for sure. I totally get that. That's a, that's a common one. Uh, maybe it makes you feel like this, just kind of that, oh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do feeling? Uh, especially if you get that letter in the mail that says it's your turn to get audited this year. Maybe you feel like this, ah, what have I done? Is it tax filing time? Oh my gosh, they have to be filed the next number of days, tomorrow, tonight, whatever it might be. Totally okay. Complex, Eric says, yeah, it can be complex for sure. I do try and find ways to uh, break it down and make it simpler, but it's, uh, we've all heard of how many thousands of pages the tax code can be. Uh, the good news is that at any given time for a small business owner, uh, for most of us, only a small portion of those thousands of pages actually applies to us. Uh, maybe it feels a little bit like this, sort of terrifying, scary, what are we going to do about that? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I've always found like those little porcelain dolls creepy as all heck. Uh, my wife and I, a little while back, uh, went to a little antique store and he had a box of just heads of these porcelain dolls. And I don't know what was doing there, but yeah, I was done being in there after seeing that. But the point is, it's okay. It's okay however you feel. It's how you feel, and it's fine. There's no right or wrong answer to it. And it can be scary, and I get that. And it doesn't have to be scary, though. But, you know, it requires a little education, knowledge, getting yourself empowered. And spotting compliance and tax savings issues really just requires a little common sense. Uh, be open-minded. Uh, especially you're going to find in presentations like this where I talk about myths and misconceptions, be open-minded to maybe learning to something that, that we thought about the tax law doesn't, doesn't really reflect the state of law after all. <clears throat> be able to look for, for details and that can-do attitude. For me, that can-do attitude is always the most important thing. Whatever the subject matter, whatever your level of education or knowledge in it, to me, if you have that can-do attitude, you're good. You're good to go. And uh, I think you guys probably already have those qualities in abundance, especially if you're running small businesses, if you're helping people, if you're doing good work out in the world, these are qualities you have. And so the rest is about just learning something, getting a little bit of knowledge, starting to get yourself empowered and that can be done. And that's what folks like me are here to do for you, to help you with. A little bit for about who I am, why I love to do this. My name's Ian Foster. I got my law degree from UC Davis uh, over 20 years ago now. And it's funny how time flies. UC Davis was a great law school for me. Very heart-centered law school. Uh, you know, it's, UC Davis is definitely not where you go if you wanted to be one of those attorneys who helps rich people steal from other rich people. UC Davis is where you go if you wanted to serve from the heart, work in the government, work in nonprofits. And so for me, it was a, a great place to be. I am still a licensed attorney in the state of California. I have my legal practice. Um, and so I have a number of clients here in California. I actually have clients around the US. Uh, and then I also have my, my coaching business. This is sort of more in the coaching side of my business with these kind of webinars where, we, where I do uh, education and empowerment for heart-centered business owners in, in the law and taxes. When it comes to taxes, I did work for 18 years in government tax agencies, so I do have just a little bit of experience here. Uh, I do kind of know what I'm talking about. I have a lot of inside knowledge, uh, and it's interesting. I've noticed, you know, as a, uh, government tax attorneys get a, an education in the tax law that's really at a much deeper, more fundamental level uh, than a lot of other folks, especially tax preparers and, and, and tax accountants. Um, we kind of have to because of the nature of the job. And so um, I actually, I, I found a good chance while I was in the government to use that. I would create training programs for auditors, accountants, other tax attorneys, and I got to travel the country teaching that stuff. And now that I'm in private practice, this is my chance to use that inside knowledge and give back to the heart center community. Um, and I mostly help coaches, healers, 
therapists, transformational leaders, speakers, authors, you know, that whole kind of, if you're out there really trying to serve, serving from the heart, trying to make a real difference in the world, that's what we kind of think of as a heart-centered community. And uh, I love being a part of it. I love being able to make a difference. Uh, and I'm making a difference in my clients' lives means I, that I'm helping with them make a difference in their clients' lives. And we all get to be part of this, this awesome ripple effect of doing good in the world. So for me, it's very motivating. Um, my client's feedback is certainly motivating for me. Uh, I do have my tax law program and Edward from New England. Loved the program, thought it was clear and understandable uh, and at the right place to take in the, for the information. Um, Edward thought I made a challenging topic, easy to understand. <coughs> Excuse me, Connie in Vermont thought the program was worth it. Uh, Connie actually uh, is a finance and accounting person, so already knew a lot about taxes, but uh, she still got a lot of value and learned a lot. Uh, so she thought it was a great program, no matter what the level of knowledge was. And so have you guys heard of the tax zombies? That's what we're here to talk about today. So the tax zombies, this is the term that I've kind of coined for tax myths, tax misconceptions uh, that just won't die. Things that people think of out there are like, hey, this is common knowledge about taxes, or everybody knows this about taxes. Uh, and it spreads around uh, almost like a virus, um, and uh, we, we just can't seem to kill it. And I know in the government, my colleagues and I, we tried very hard to kill t some of these tax zombies, and they just won't die no matter how hard we try to kill them. So that's why these, I call these myths uh, tax zombies. We would we would do PSAs and educational spots and all kinds of stuff, but some of these myths just keep going around. And so a little bit what you can expect from, uh, from our webinar today. We're gonna to talk about three tax zombies. And these are three, I mean, there are lots of tax zombies out there. I'm gonna try and focus on three just, you know, because for time's sake, and so we can try and focus on a few uh, and get through them. But these tax zombies, they cost you money and put you at risk. So one is that I hear all the time, hey, if I report a loss too many years in a row, my business is a hobby and I can't deduct, deduct my expenses anymore. Uh, you guys might have heard this from your preparer or your accountant. Uh, another zombie, if I form my business entity in another state, maybe I can save taxes or even avoid taxes altogether. If I find some state with low or no um, business income tax, hey, I can save tax, right? And then another one, people love getting tax refunds. Tax refunds are awesome. That's another tax zombie. So we're going to talk about why these are actually myths uh, that I keep trying to kill and how they keep kind of raising from the dead. Uh, plus, you know, taxes, you know, as you guys pointed out in the chat, are very complex, of course. There's a lot to it. Uh, this free class is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and so if you do want an opportunity to dig deeper, we'll have that opportunity uh, to learn a whole lot more. And, you know, one thing I ask folks, you know, how many attorneys have this kind of tax experience, uh, 18 years in the government doing various taxes, that kind of inside knowledge and experience? Uh, you know, and work specifically now full time, specialize in the heart centered business community and offer this type of proactive tax education. I tell you, there's not a whole lot out there. There are a few of us attorneys out there. Uh, you know, we're a very small army uh, trying to do this good uh, and get people educated and empowered in this kind of subject matter. But I'll tell you, there's not very many of us and, and we pretty much all know each other, um, you know, collaborate together because we know that uh, none of us can do it alone. And uh, if you stay till the end, of course, there will be a fast action bonus. So pretty good fast action bonus, actually a lot of value in this fast action bonus that people have taken advantage of before. So my little legal disclaimer, you know, we are talking about the law. I'm an attorney. I have to go through this. Uh, you know, this is a, probably a good example for this kind of stuff you should have on a, a webinar, especially if you have a, a professional license of some sort that you need to protect. So this webinar is not uh, actual legal services or advice. This is intended to be education only. Uh, being on here does not mean that there's an attorney-client relationship. This does not make me your attorney. There's no attorney relationship with our business. Um, I cannot make any guarantees on here. You know, like I said before, the, if you ask, uh, especially tax attorneys, you ask them questions, they're almost always gonna say, it depends. Uh, tax savings and tax risk are very fact specific, very situation dependent. It depends a lot on your own stuff. So I can't guarantee that you apply what you learn in here that you're gonna save money or avoid audit or penalties. Those are just not the promises that any kind of ethical attorney can make. Uh, and I cannot guarantee the confidentiality on here because there's no, there's no attorney client relationship. There's, so there's no absolute legal privilege. So we all should be responsible for, for what we choose to say on this webinar. But I do appreciate you guys being here. So 
Uh, you may or may not today uh, hear in the background some kitten noise. My wife and I are, are, we are a little kitten family. They go with us everywhere. We're up in the mountains, so they're up in the mountains with us. These are two of our little guys. And so my question here is when you do your taxes, do you sleep like a kitten? And uh, the answer for most folks is no, which is okay, because I get it. Like you guys said, it's a little bit scary, complex, nerve wracking, but I try to get everyone to you know, a more empowering place where, where we can relax and have that confidence, where we can lay down like these little guys. These are two of our younger ones, Samson and Solomon. Uh, they're not so much kittens anymore. They were kittens here. They're, they're about a year and a half now and they're big little boys. So let's get into the tax zombie myths. Uh, and the first one, okay, so my business didn't make enough money. So now it's a hobby and I can't deduct my expenses anymore. You guys may have heard this. Um, this is one I hear all the time. Uh, I, I work with new clients, potential clients, and they tell me, oh, well, I was told my business was a hobby. So it's a bummer. I can't use those losses. And I'm like, hang on, hang on. Let's talk about this. Uh, this turns out not to be true. Uh, in a lot of circumstances. In fact, so far, every time someone has come to me and said that they were told this by their accountant, it's turned out to be wrong. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be wrong literally every time, but it's been wrong every time I've seen it so far. So, and this is one that no matter how much I try to debunk, I keep hearing it. Um, and it's, it's one thing that bugs me is that a lot of tax preparers, uh, tax accountants spread this myth around. So, is it really the law? that if you have a business which loses money and it gets reclassified as a hobby? And the answer is no, as you might've guessed from how I'm approaching this. The answer is absolutely 100% no, that is not the law. This has never been the law. Uh, so it always astonishes me that when this myth gets floated around, which is why this is a tax zombie, it just keeps walking around. We can chop its head off and this one keeps walking around. That's just not the state of the law. Uh, if this were the state of the law, then when I was uh, auditing businesses for the government, I would have been reclassifying businesses like Google and Microsoft as hobbies uh, because they didn't make money for tax purposes. This is just not the way things work in the tax law. If you have a profit motive and you can prove it, then your business is not a hobby, period. And there are certain factors that distinguish a business from a hobby, but losing money is not one of those factors, as it turns out. And I hear all the time, well, but my tax accountant told me, uh, and you'll often hear it, you know, you'll hear tax preparers, tax accountants say, well, hey, if you lose money X years in a row, uh, it's a hobby and you, you can't deduct the expenses, or you can just deduct the expenses against whatever little income, and then you lose the rest. You lose all the losses, you can't use them to offset. That is what I would call a lazy and incorrect look at the tax law. There is, in some circumstances, a sort of rule of thumb, but again, it's not the law. It's just kind of a rule of thumb in some circumstances that might mean that some activities are presumed to be a hobby. But even then, it's not that hard to rebut the presumption with a little bit of evidence. So what is a hobby in? Well, a hobby under the tax law is an unincorporated activity. So it's not a corporation or a limited liability company or any sort of business entity. It's, it's a sole proprietorship that does not exist to earn a profit. That's a hobby. Uh, and that probably does not describe your business. And even if you do have a hobby, you can still deduct the hobby expenses against the hobby income. You just can't use the net losses against your income from other sources. And so sometimes I've even heard accountants say, well, it's a hobby, you can't deduct anything. And then they make you report the income and that's doubly wrong. So how do you show that your business is not a hobby? Uh, well, number one, run it under a business entity. Like if you form a corporation or a limited liability company, nobody's gonna start telling you it's a hobby. At least they shouldn't, because then they're really perpetuating a huge misconception. Because sort of by definition under the tax law, if you're running, running it under a business entity, it cannot be a hobby by definition. And honestly, you should have a business entity anyway. Uh, this is something we talk about in some of my other uh, educational webinars, the importance of that. Keep your records and receipts make a profit and loss statement, have business plans. These are things you can do even if you do not run it under an entity. So even if you're a sole proprietor, as long as you have your records, you have your P&L statements, you have your business plan, this is all stuff that's showing that you're running business, that you're trying to make money. 
uh, show that you have knowledge and expertise in the field. Show that you've put in time and effort. Like this is not something you pass the time on the side while your quote unquote real job or your real business earns the money, but this is where you're putting your time and effort. Those are how you show your business a hobby. And notice what I did not say there. I did not say earn a profit. You don't need to earn a profit to show it's not a hobby. That turns out not to be one of the factors. So when people say, well, you didn't earn a profit X years in a row, it's just a, a lazy and incorrect interpretation of the tax law. That, that's not one of the factors in there. You can lose money for as long as you want, and especially for tax purposes. The, the, the thing is, you can make money economically and pay your bills and live a decent life and still lose money on paper for tax purposes. In fact, that's kind of the ideal way to set it up. That's kind of how you want to set it up. And there are, there are illegal ways to do that, but there are plenty of legal ways to do that too. So I help folks do that the legal way. So losing money for tax purposes is kind of, it's especially absurd to me when I hear, well, you lost money on your tax return, so it must be a hobby. Well, just because you lost money in your tax return doesn't mean you actually lost money from an economic perspective. Um, I've had businesses where I've made pretty decent money and on the tax return it shows uh, a, you know, a net zero or a loss because you can plan to set it up that way. There's nothing wrong with that. So, and you know, a point I like to make here is don't let your tax preparer take your power in this regard. A lot of tax preparers, they want to tell you what to do as though it's their return. It's not their return. It's your return. They work for you. So they're supposed to do what you want on it. And if they won't, and if what you're asking them to do, it's one thing if you're asking them to do something that's illegal or unethical and they won't do it, that's fine. They're just upholding their professional ethics, nothing wrong with that. Uh, if I have clients come to me as an attorney and they want me to do something illegal or unethical, I say no. But if my clients ask me to do something that's perfectly legal and does not run afoul of my ethical boundaries, then I do it because that's my job. That's what I'm getting paid for. So if your tax preparer won't do it, uh, then find someone who will. And telling them to let you deduct your losses on your for-profit business and use those losses against other income, there's nothing illegal or unethical about that. That's your right. You're entitled to that under the law. So any questions about this subject, what we talked about so far? This little Russian blue is our little girl we call her Cinderella. She was our Christmas miracle kitten a few years ago, a few Christmases ago. She, we got her, she was itty bitty tiny, little feral, malnourished and sick. All the doctors said she would not make it, but she did. So she's our little Christmas miracle kitty. And uh, clients who work with me get to meet all the kitties sooner or later. They typically show up on the classes, on the webinars. Uh, we even bring them to our physical offices. My, uh, you know, my wife's a therapist, they're therapy kitties. So they're, they just, uh, they become part of the business. Hey, Ian, I do have a question. Yeah, please. This is Chris. Um, you're saying to show your business um, that it's taking a loss. Are you using all your deductions to create that, making it look like it, you made a loss in the, how do yeah. you show that? I don't even know how to ask this question, but. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's uh, the way it works, basically, I don't want to get too deep into it uh, here. Um, but the, you know, you have to report if you run a business, you have to report all your income that the business brings in your gross income. Uh, and then you get to deduct from that ordinary and necessary business expenses to reduce that down to the to the taxable income, which is when you actually apply the tax rate and figure out how much you owe. Well, your ordinary and necessary business expenses are all the things you need to run the business, all the expenses you need to make the income. Uh, now, some of those are real economic expenses, right? So you, you had to pay for internet. So you had to fork out money to do that, right? Or, you know, if your business is, is delivering groceries, you need to pay for a vehicle and car insurance. Those are real expenses, economic expenses. Now, some of your, in your heart-centered business, um, a lot of folks, a lot of your, your lifestyle can be deductible. I mean, if you travel to a conference to meet people, this is part of your lifestyle that's also tax deductible. You know, so and it's it's not some of your in a way some of your personal expenses become legitimate, perfectly legal and legitimate deductible business expenses. You also have have non economic expenses you can deduct things like depreciation and amortization. Uh, so there are different ways. You like so if you're renting property out or something, you can depreciate the property. You know, and so that's not an expense you actually have to fork out, but you can deduct it currently to save money now. So there are ways to still make money and live 
and, and show uh, a very low profit for tax purposes or no profit or even a tax loss for tax purposes. Uh, again, a lot of the world's most successful, richest corporations, uh, part of how they pay nothing in taxes uh, is they don't show any profit for tax purposes. Um, you know, so you look at some of these giant corporations on, you look at their tax return and you think, oh my gosh, they're losing money hand over fist. Oh, they're not losing anything. They're making out just fine. Thank you very much. Everybody's doing okay. But there are ways to, uh, to, to reduce that taxable profit on your return, ways to do it legally. Lots of illegal ways to do it too. In fact, when I worked for the government, for many years, one of my primary job was prosecuting super wealthy and giant multinational corporations who were using the illegal ways to do it. So I know better than anyone how to do it illegally. I won't help you do it illegally. I refuse to do that. That, you know, speaking of things that are against the law and against my ethics, I won't do that. But I will help people do it legally for sure. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> no, thank you. It was very mm -hmm. good. So zombie myth number two. This is another big one you hear all the time. If I form my business entity in some other state or province, I can save money on taxes or avoid it altogether. So you may hear this a lot. You will hear this sometimes on radio ads, TV ads, internet advertisements. Uh, you may hear it from your tax preparer or your tax preparer's friend. Or, I mean, there's all kinds of sources to hear this myth. Uh, they'll say, hey, uh, you should, let's take Nevada. A lot of people like to use Nevada. Uh, you know, uh, you just moved from Nevada, right? So from Las Vegas. A lot of people use Nevada and say, hey, Nevada has no uh, income tax. So we're gonna form your corporation or your limited liability at company in Nevada and move all your income over there and you don't have to pay tax anymore, hooray, right? But you don't actually have to move to Nevada to do it, right? Uh, if that sounds too good to be true, it's because it is too good to be true. Again, that is simply not how the tax law works. It has never been how the tax law works. Um, and when I worked uh, for the state of California's primary tax agency, one of our largest, biggest sources of audit was people who formed businesses in other states thinking that that meant they didn't have to pay tax in California anymore. Uh, in fact, a lot of states, uh, I, I worked with some folks in the New York Department of Revenue and they audited that very subject all the time. New York residents formed their business somewhere else, Delaware, Wyoming, thought they didn't have to pay taxes in New York. It just doesn't work that way. Not how the law works but you get a lot of people who look and sound like experts uh, who keep promoting this. Some of them are experts, which tells you something because it means they know better and they're just taking your money knowing that this is not gonna work for you. So, you know, the question then, can I form my, my corporation, my LLC in some low tax, no tax state and save money, avoid taxes? No, the answer is no. The answer has always been no, it's always going to be no. This is a zombie myth because we have, this is one where we're talking about doing advertisements and PSAs. And so we, we uh, you know, in the state of California, the government put out, you know, radio advertisements and sent out flyers to people who filed tax returns saying, hey, don't fall for this. This is a scam. And yet, and, and we even found businesses promoting this scam and shut them down. We put a few people in jail for promoting this and it still keeps coming up, which is why this is a zombie myth. Okay. The, the, the way the law works is you are subject to the tax laws where you actually live. You're subject to the tax laws where you're actually doing business. You just are. That's independent of where you formed your business entity. If, you're, if you live uh, in Ohio and do business in Ohio, you're paying taxes in Ohio. Doesn't matter where your business entity is. That's just how the system works. But I read this article, right? I was told by an expert and you will find articles out there you will find so-called experts who will tell you this. Uh, but this, this myth is promoted by money people who it's literally what they do is make money by fooling you. And very much this is kind of a con and a scam because a lot of people promoting this know very well that this doesn't work. Some of them are so-called innocents. Uh, they've been duped into it uh, and they think it works and they help you do it thinking it will work for you. And then they get a big surprise in the mail when we're shutting down their business for promoting an illegal tax scam. Uh, and especially watch out for this when they want money to help you do it, right? When they say, hey, uh, you, I'm not only advising you to go set up your business in Nevada, but I'll do it for you. You know, give me a thousand bucks and I'll go do it for you. When it turns out, if you wanted a business in Nevada, and unless you live there, there's not a lot of reason to ha have one there. Uh, you could have done it a lot easier and cheaper yourself. But for a lot of folks, it sounds very believable, right? Well, my business is in Nevada. Nevada has no income tax, so no income tax. 
it seems to have a certain amount of logic if if you haven't had a lot of you know fundamental education in the tax law so i get why it seems to make sense so what does really happen if i form my business in some state where i don't live what are the actual consequences okay so okay all right yeah and you've told me that doing that does not mean i get to avoid taxes well what does it mean okay here's what it does mean uh number one it means you still pay tax where you live Okay, forming your business somewhere else doesn't change the fact that you're still subject to tax where you're living and working. Okay, so nothing changes there, still paying tax. Plus, you now be, be paying tax in the other state too. You've gone and formed your business in another state. What that means is that you have now voluntarily subjected yourself to the jurisdiction of that other state. So you're gonna pay whatever annual fees they have there, whatever annual taxes, and it turns out if they have some small income tax, you're probably paying there too. Uh, and you now have to register your entity as a foreign company where you live. So registering your entity as a foreign company where you live uh, may cost extra money as well. So how do I save money with a low tax state? Okay, let's say I want to, let's say I really want to form a business in Nevada. They have no income tax, right? And I want to do that right and save no money. Well, then move there. You got to move there and form your business there. That's how you do it. Uh, there's nothing against the law about physically moving to another state and living there and operating your business there. People do it all the time. That's how you save money. Um, but uh, you know, even then, one thing to be careful of is if you're doing business with clients all over, you, you know, a lot of states now have what we call a like, quote, doing business threshold. And, and that threshold for doing business in their state may be very low. It may be you have a client in that state who paid you a certain amount of money or you did a certain kind of work in that state. So even if you move to this low tax or no tax state, you still may owe tax in states where you have clients, depending on how much business you're doing in those states. So be careful with that too. So it's, you know, don't fall for this tax zombie. Um, one thing to be careful of is people say, okay, so I have to actually move to Nevada. And so they'll say, all right, I'm gonna get a driver's license in Nevada, I'm gonna get a PO box there. Uh, I'm gonna register to vote there. That doesn't do it. That's not gonna be considered moving there and being a resident there. Uh, you have to actually physically get up and do it. Uh, the other thing to be careful of, I have worked with a number of folks who have left what they thought was a high tax state to physically move where they did all the right stuff. They packed up all their stuff, they put their kids and dogs in the car, they bought a house and they moved to the what they thought was the low tax state and they got there and a year later they get their tax bills and they're like, wait a minute, I thought I was going to save taxes. I went to a lot of trouble to uproot my family to move here and now I'm paying more in taxes. How does that happen? Did they not look at the tax rates before they went? Well, uh, in a sense, no, they didn't. Uh, often what people do is they're only looking at one tax rate. They're comparing the income tax rate to where they are to the income tax rate where they're going. And they forget to look at sales taxes and property taxes and other kinds. Of, there's all kinds of taxes. Income tax is just one of them. Uh, and so I've, I've worked with a number of folks. A very common example is moving from California to say Texas, where California has a high income tax rate. Texas has no income tax. What they didn't think of, they bought a giant house in Texas, right? California has the lowest property taxes in the country. Texas has high property taxes. So they went there and yeah, they paid no more income tax, but the extra property tax they paid more than offset it. So they ended up paying more in taxes. So even if you're going to go through it and moving to another state, be careful with that. It may not save you what you think you're, it's going to save you. This is Jonesy. She's our little driver kitty. Whenever we drive anywhere, she has to be the one in the driver's lap. Any questions about this subject? I've actually uh, got yes. a question, yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Ian? Yes. If you're something, if you're, um, let's say, like a manufacturer's rep, where you have clients all over the country, um, what or how do they determine, or do how is the tax you owe in a particular state determined? Uh, that's a more complicated issue. Um, It, you may you may get a safe harbor on that. There is a federal law that gives a safe harbor 
for that kind of activity. I don't want to say for sure it applies to you because it's it's got a lot of factors and I would really have to know a lot specifically about how you work. But there is a, there's a federal law that was passed back in the 1950s to give a safe harbor to that sort of activity where if really all you're doing is traveling around as a rep who's selling somebody else's product or service, then you can, um, you can do that without being subject to tax in all the destination states. So there, there may be a safe harbor for your activity. You don't necessarily owe tax everywhere, fortunately. That would be a, a huge pain to file all those returns. So how do all of these network marketing and affiliate marketing companies work? Mm -hmm. uh, that's Some that's, of them are international. That's a whole interesting subject matter that I think a lot of it is still being hashed out in the courts. When I left government service, that was a subject that was really just becoming kind of a hot topic. So, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't had any of those kind of companies as my clients, so I don't know how they are filing per se, but I know that's something that the government, when I left government service, we were starting to look into. Um, Can I speak to that for a sec? Yeah, please um, go ahead just, if you know something book, about that. As a bookkeeper, um, you know, basically a lot of the network marketing, like if you're a, an individual rep for that, um, you don't have to deal with it. Uh, it's the major, it's the company itself that is, is uh, filing. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're filing correctly or whatever, but, um, you know, the individual reps themselves typically don't have that, that on them. They can do whatever and all of the money goes back to, to the main company. That yeah, thank you. That's thank you, Sarah. That's a good clarification. I appreciate that. Yeah, when when we were starting to look into that, uh, you know, and I've, I've left the government service, so I don't know how far they've gotten into it now. But when we were starting to, uh, that's a good clarification. We were not necessarily looking at the individual folks, uh, you know, at the bottom of the ladder. They were not so much our concern. Um, our concern was kind of the big top company and how they were filing anyway. But yeah, that's, uh, you know, I don't know how like I said, I haven't looked at the returns of the actual companies at the top to see how they're filing. Um, I have a hunch uh, that they're probably not filing everywhere they're supposed to. But again, that's just a hunch, um, you know, based on my experience. And I could be totally wrong. And with that, um, sorry, <laughs> with that, there's actually a couple of places. Um, oh, I'm going to mispronounce it. Avalara. Uh, tax jar that are online portals that basically can help you, mm -hmm. um, you know, you connect to all 50 states or wherever you're selling. Um, and that's especially for sales tax purposes um, that they'll kind of keep track of that for you. And they're supposed to keep track of, you know, whether it's a nexus, whether it's a threshold, whether it's, you know, whatever that is. And you just connect to the, you tell them where you're selling and they'll, they'll connect to the right entities. So yeah. Um, it's a little pricey to have them do that, but in some respects, I'm kind of thinking it's not a bad idea uh, if you're no, having to I deal would, with sales tax. Yeah, especially if you're if you're dealing with multi-state income tax and multi-state sales tax issues, and sales tax is even worse because now it's 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 not just state jurisdictions; it's local jurisdictions. You could be dealing with literally thousands of jurisdictions. So I would pay someone. I mean, I have I have friends who worked for. Um, you know, companies where all they did full time was make sure they were sales tax compliant in the thousands of jurisdictions where they sold stuff, uh, you know, and they charged a lot of money for that service. So, uh, you know, for me, it would totally be worth it to pay for one of those services because I can't imagine it, it would be a full time job literally to try and track that. One more question, if I may. Yeah, please. If, if you have multiple residents, what determines what state you actually live in? That is going to depend on the laws of the states where you reside. Um, there are some rules of thumb that, uh, I mean, typically it's going to be where you spend the most time physically, you know, when your, your physical person spends the, you know, uh, either a majority or at least a plurality of the time somewhere. Uh, and that may be it, but not necessarily uh, that, cause that's not the only factor. Um, it's, it's also going to be looking at things, you know, there's a number of factors, you know, and some of them are kind of surface factors, things like where's your driver's license, where you register to vote, right? But those are, those are just a couple factors. That's why when people just go do that somewhere, they think that works, it doesn't work. Um, so physical location is going to be the number one primary factor. Always, phys your physical person, wherever that's located, that will override anything else. 
So you could have all the factors in state X, but your physical person spends 90% of the time in state Y, you're going to be resident in state Y. That will override everything, number one. But then there's also things, you know, like, I mean, where do you, where are you deducting your mortgage, mortgage expense for your primary residence, uh, you know, if you are? Um, you know, and then things like driver's license and register to vote. Things like where are your doctor's appointments? Uh, that, that's often a big factor. That's somehow, that's one way we used to catch people. So we would find out where their doctors were. Uh, when they were trying to fake where their residence was. So, you you know, where are you seeing doctors is a big one. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, the states will look at your credit card receipts. And other than online purchases, which doesn't really count for that, they'll look at where you're spending money. Uh, so a lot of different stuff, where your car is registered. Um, it's basically anything and everything. Like there's no one single factor. Uh, there was a case in California some years back that set forth a bunch of factors and it had dozens of factors in it. And even that case made clear that it was not exhaustive. So I don't know if that answers, but that's, you know, it's again, that's one of those sort of, it depends answers. Great, thank you both for your information. Uh -huh. And I've got a quick question too, or yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so when I, when I moved from Nevada to Tennessee, um, I shut down my LLC in Nevada. I reopened it in Tennessee and I was told that, and so I, I kind of want to get a second opinion here. I was told that um, basically since that name was actually still available, Dream Builder Book Keeper is that name was still available in Tennessee that I could just reopen it under the same EIN number. And all I had to do was submit an EIN address change, which of course I tried doing all of that during COVID and um, which I mean, government, it's so efficient to begin with. And then mm -hmm. you add a pandemic and, um, and so they were like, yeah, that's going to take us like 10 weeks to, to process. And then we'll let you know. And I was just like, I really hope, and, and it's been well, well over 10 weeks and I haven't heard anything. So yeah. I don't know what my recourse is. I don't really know what I can or should or shouldn't do. Um, that I'm like, hey, I tried to be legal. I tried to do all the business attorney stuff. I tried to do my due diligence and Google everything. But dear Lord, it make, they make it very difficult to like, here are the steps to do, you know, to move and to take your business with you. Um, do you have any resources that you are aware of that kind of is, that kind of says, hey, these are, this is the government buck stops here, you know, how to do that, like about, for instance, the threshold, um, you know, doing business uh, in other states, because many of my clients are in other states. Yeah, um, I, I don't oh. have any one resource for that. Uh, I have 50 of them, because we have 50 <laughs> states. Uh, that's just, you know, it's sort of, um, the United States is a funny place. Um, there are a lot of advantages to our federal system of government with a bunch of, where we have 50 semi-sovereign subdivisions. Mm -hmm. And there are disadvantages. A lot of things I like about our system. We get to have 50 places with 50 different sets of laws. And if you don't like the laws in state A, you can go to state B where you like it. And then people in state B can move to state A. You can, you know, a lot of great things uh, about our founders, great, you know, experiment in democracy, the way they set it up. A lot of advantages. Disadvantages, uh, you know, it's sort of the same thing. The great thing is we have 50 different sets of laws. So you don't like the laws somewhere, you go somewhere else. But that's also a disadvantage, right? Uh, in our modern world. When this was set up, people didn't leave the state they were born in for the most part. You know, a lot of people never left the county they were born in for their whole lives. So you never had to worry about laws in other places. Well, in our modern world, where we're working everywhere and sometimes living everywhere, this is a lot trickier. So now you have 50 jurisdictions you have to deal with um, and they all have different laws and for all of them doing business means something different. Some of them have economic nexus, some of them don't. Some of them have physical nexus, some of them don't. Some of them have economic nexus for their sales tax, but not for their income tax or vice versa. I mean, it's just, it's a huge patchwork, it's nuts. And we've tried to get the states together to have, uh, you know, these interstate compacts. And sometimes that goes well, sometimes it doesn't go so well. Um, you know, one place I would look to, uh, California's laws tend to be the leader when it comes to tax laws. Where California goes, the other states follow eventually. Some follow quickly, some take decades. 
but eventually they all follow because California is kind of the 800 pound gorilla. We've got the biggest population, the biggest economy, the most sophisticated uh, tax system and bureaucracy. And so, I mean, California kind of set the modern tax system uh, back in the 1930s with its, with its interstate tax rules for corporations and every state has ended up following it in one way or another. So, you know, you could look to, um, I mean, you know, sort of the quote right thing to do would be you everywhere you have to client, you'd have to go to that state's website and look up their doing business standard. And try and figure out for yourself if you if you fit it or not. Been um, there, done that. It's not quite as clear as you'd it's like not. it to be. <laughs> no, 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 it's not at all. It's not at all. Um, you know, or you could look at states like California and New York, the 800, 800 pound gorillas, and look what their standards are, and kind of figure well if you satisfy their standards, <clears throat> you know, like those are might be the ones you go with, and then take advantage of things like. Um, uh, credit for taxes paid in other states so you don't end up double paying. Uh, oftentimes your home state will give you, you know, so let's say you look at the doing business standard in California and you think, well, I satisfy that for all these clients. So I'm just going to file in these five different places just, just to be safe. And you pay a little bit of tax there because you're only going to pay the tax for the amount you made in that state, not on your whole income. There's going to be a way to apportion it. So you're just paying it for that state because you're not a resident there. But then in your home state, you owe income on your own tax on everything. You're taxed from everywhere because they have complete personal jurisdiction over you. But your home state then will usually give you a tax credit for the taxes you paid in the other states. So you're not double paying. So in, a, in effect, your home state is subsidizing your interstate business. Because uh, they would still rather have you there than not. It's kind of the theory. You know, for, so for your home state, it's a revenue loser. But in the long run, they're still better off with you there than not there. That makes sense. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, and also, any any pings on that EIN address change? Is oh, that a weird thing? <laughs> uh, I will say that's not how I would have recommended you do it. Oh, I was afraid of that. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. I mean, it's done. What what the the worst they can do is come at me and and say, hey, this isn't legal, and then I'll be like, sorry, tried it. Uh, what do you need me to do? Well, so. your worst case scenario, I think, is you just have to reapply for a new EIN. Okay. That's probably your worst case scenario, which is not the worst thing in the world. It's a bit of a pain. I mean, it only takes five minutes to do online, it's and then you to have do. to then you have to call up your bank and everybody else that uses your EIN uh, and change it. So it's a little bit of a pain, uh, but I think that's probably your worst case scenario. Usually, when uh, now. It may be that the way I would recommend doing it, you couldn't do it in Tennessee, which is why you had to do it the way you did. Some states will let you sort of, uh, they'll let you take your other state business. So you had a Nevada business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you could come to Tennessee and you register your that Nevada business as a foreign company in Tennessee uh, so that it's, it's legal to do business in Tennessee now. And then you immediately flip and convert that foreign to a domestic uh, Tennessee company. And you do all that, well, it's sort of a, a couple step process for keeping the same company rather than having to close one and reopen a new company. Gotcha. And that way you would have kept your EIN. Now, Tennessee may not have that mechanism for all I know, which is maybe why you had to do it the way you did. I was I consulting with a Nevada business attorney and, and he, that's what he suggested. And he goes, he goes, granted, I don't know all the laws in Tennessee. And so I was right. like, okie dokie. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, he was probably doing his best with the knowledge he had. I'm sure he wasn't trying to, <laughs> you know. No, no, he, no, I've used him before and he, he wasn't trying to steer me wrongly. I just, uh, so I was just getting a second opinion. So thank you. Yeah. I don't want to take up any more time on no, that. No, that's okay. No problem at all. I'm here for questions. Not a big deal. Appreciate it. Okay, the final zombie myth. And some of you have a little bit of tax knowledge. You might, you guys may know this one already, hopefully. Right, the tax refunds are awesome. I love getting a big fat check from the government every year. Who doesn't love getting a big giant tax refund every year, right? Big check, sounds great. Uh, I don't. As, as a longtime government tax attorney, uh, I realized very quickly I didn't like getting a tax refund check uh, because it's my money. And I did not wanna give the government a big interest-free loan every year. And why would anyone want to do that? Now, some people, I guess their answer is, well, I would rather do that than get in trouble or whatever, but it's, I don't know, it's, to me, it's, you're throwing money away and it's not really that hard uh, to make sure that you don't get a giant refund every year. 
a refund, <clears throat> remember a refund is a refund. It means it's an overpayment. It means you did not owe it in the first place. It's your money and it was always your money. And when you loan it to the government, you're losing economic power on that money. I mean, you know, when you talk about the time value of money, $100 today is worth more than $100 a year from now. If I give the government $100 today and a year from now, I get that same $100 back, I have lost economic purchasing power in the meantime. Uh, and it's totally avoidable. There are a number of mechanisms to avoid it. There are various, there are forms you can use to try and calculate your estimated tax if you need to, if you're looking at withholding. The IRS has a withholding calculator on their site that's actually very uh, well structured that can help you avoid doing this. Um, for me, there is no um, <clears throat> optimal amount. Now, last year I did pretty well. Uh, at the end of the year, I had, I think, a $40 refund. <clears throat> So I got it about as close to zero as you can get. I've never seen anyone get it exactly to zero. I'm sure it's, you know, it's, it's possible in theory, <clears throat> very difficult to do down to the penny. Uh, but if you can get it down where you're getting a tiny refund or actually even better where you owe a little bit at the end of the year, that's the best place you can be. That means the government gave you an interest-free loan. Now, if you owe too much, they'll have penalties attached to it. So you don't wanna do that. But if you get it down to where you owe a small amount at the end of the year, then you haven't had to loan the government anything interest-free. Uh, and in fact, they've given you a small interest-free loan, but not so high that you owe penalties. So the optimal place to be is where you kind of owe a little bit at the end of the year, but not so much that you get the penalties on it. Um, <clears throat> if I had a nickel for every time I've heard, Hey, but my, my accountants, I love my accountants. They get me a big refund every year and they know what they're doing, right? If I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I would have uh, enough nickels to make a big giant tax refund out of it. For me, coming from the perspective of a government attorney, this was always a red, red flag for me. It's one thing if you get a big refund one year because your circumstances change, okay? You had a huge expense, you had a drop in income. There are reasons it can happen where a year comes along, you have a change in circumstances, you, you can't adjust your withholding or estimated payments fast enough, um, you know, or you didn't expect the circumstances, so you didn't adjust, and you get a refund. That it's not a big deal if it happens once in a while. But I've had folks come to me and they're like, um, but I'm super happy with my tax preparer because for the last 20 years, they've gotten me a big refund. And I'm like, okay, hang on. Every year? And they never adjust how you're doing this? Um, you know, they, sh they should know better if that's happening every year. And so for me, that kind of raises some questions. One, if they know what refunds are and represent, if they know that it means you're losing economic purchasing power, and if they haven't talked about that with you. Now, if they've talked about that with you and you said, well, I still want the refund for whatever reason, then they're just, you know, doing what you tell them to do, which is what they're paid to do. But if they haven't talked about that with you and they keep getting you the refund, I would really question why they're planning your taxes like that. And if they don't understand what refunds represent, uh, then to me, it, it pulls into question their qualifications to do your taxes. Um, so it's, you know, it's one thing if you, if you are fully aware going into it, I know what a refund is, I know I'm losing economic purchasing power on that $5,000 every year, but I still wanna do that for some reason, okay. But if, if it's happening over and over without you really being aware of, of what it is and what it means, um, then that to me is a red flag. So again, uh, I put this in the tax zombie category because it's very hard to dispel because a lot of people, even when I explain it, you know, it's just like, well, but I'd rather have the refund. Um, okay. Uh, if, you know, okay, I get it. It's, I'm giving the interest-free loan to the government every year, but I'd I'd rather have the refund. And sometimes, you know, it's still part of it is sometimes the reason is, well, because I'd rather get the refund than owe, uh, because if I owe, I, I won't have the discipline to save the money. Or I won't have the, dis or, you know, I don't want to owe penalties, but it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to owe so much at the end of the year that you get penalties. If you can plan not to get a refund, you can plan not to owe so much that you get penalties. And again, even if you have unforeseen circumstances that suddenly mean you owe a lot at the end of the year, uh, if that happens once in a while, you won't get hit, hit with penalties. There are exceptions for that sort of thing. They know that there are circumstances that come up. Uh, and if you're concerned about being disciplined about saving the money for owing a little bit at the end of the year, um, <clears throat> well then set it up so you get a tiny refund. 
Um, you know, I, I've had clients who come to me and they're getting, they're getting massive refunds every year, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars a year. I mean, geez, uh, you wouldn't give your bank an eight thousand dollar interest free loan every year, you know, and just not have access to that money. Um, so, you know, that I have a hard time understanding, but it's again, if you can avoid getting a huge refund year after year, I would do that. Over the long run, because of the economic purchasing power of money, that actually is gonna save you money. Uh, any more questions? I have one more question, Ian, and mm -hmm. I hope it's not too specific. Um, maybe you can generally answer it. Last year, I'm kind of new to this entrepreneurship. I've been doing it about three or four years. Um, last year, I opened a SEP IRA to offset so many dollars that I had to give to the government by putting it in the SEP IRA. Mm -hmm. And let's just, I'm just going to even out the numbers. So say I put 10000 last year in the SEP IRA, didn't make a little money. And now this year, I'm eligible to put 6000 in a SEP IRA to offset my, to even my out my taxes. Can I take? Six thousand out of that ten thousand, and take it out, and then put it back in. Um, I think if you take it out, you're going to be subject to some withdrawal penalties or taxes on it. So, is that legal, though? I mean, should I check with my guy that has my IRA? Because um, yeah. I, I was under the impression that I only had to pay taxes on the amount that I profited, like that, that it grew from the original? Does is that sound right? I would check on that because I haven't okay. looked at IRAs are not something specifically I've had to deal with in a long time. Okay, <clears throat> I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'll just check, so, with, and that, check that, with my financial guy. Should, would that be the person that has the yeah. IRA? Well, right, because that's that actually, those, sign of, those kind of retirement accounts are actually with, those are like a specialty within a specialty on taxes. Mm -hmm. And I know enough to be dangerous with them, but that's not my specialty within the specialty. And so okay. I don't want to give you the wrong advice. Uh, my sense okay. is, is that that would be problematic. But okay. um, I would check with, you know, your financial planner, you know, that's what they deal with day in and day out. Okay. Is Thank that you. sort of thing. So I would check with them. Just I trying to get to... creative. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with being creative and thinking outside the box as long as it doesn't end up costing you more than you save. Correct, correct. You know, so like I said, that's, that's a, that's a, yeah, when you dive deeper, that's even like a, an internal specialty. And I know the general rules about it, but I don't always know all the specific differences between all the different kinds. And so I don't want to give you bad advice there. I appreciate that. Thank mm -hmm. you. <clears throat> so, okay, so just to recap real quick, we've talked today about a few different tax zombies, business versus hobby. Uh, and my point there is if you're trying to make a profit, it's a business. And don't let somebody tell you otherwise. Just don't let them tell you otherwise. If you have a profit motive and you can prove it, you get to deduct the expenses. And if it's a net loss, that's even better. You can use that net loss against your other income your spouse's income, your rental income, your other business, whatever it might be. Don't waste, don't waste those expenses. Don't waste those, those losses. Uh, be careful about where you're incorporating your business. For almost every client I deal with, my advice is to incorporate the business where they live. Now, there are exceptions to that, but that is, that is almost always the right way to do it. Be very careful before incorporating a business in another state. Uh, and it is, it is rare where you can incorporate a business in another state and expect tax savings. There might be other reasons, non-tax related reasons to incorporate it elsewhere. There are lots of non-tax reasons that people incorporate in Delaware, for example. They're not doing it to save on taxes. But uh, if you see these ads to, hey, come form your business in another state to save taxes, don't, don't fall for that one. And then refunds sound great uh, until you realize what they actually represent. <clears throat> So now what? I mean, uh, I've, you know, tried to give you guys some good information. Uh, like I said, I could have gone on and I can go on and on about taxes. I mean, I did this forever, um, you know, and I enjoy the subject matter. I enjoy helping people on about it. But uh, I tried to give you some knowledge that you guys can run with and do something with. 
<clears throat> and that's great. And I have confidence in you. Or if you want to keep working together, then we can totally work together. And I would be glad to do that. I can play a more active role in this and expand your knowledge base, really get you empowered. So you're making empowered decisions on this all the time. Um, the unfortunate truths about taxes. I mean, you've heard, you know, what are the certainties in life? They're death and taxes, right? You have to deal with taxes. You have to. You don't get to choose not to, whether you want to or not, whether you like it or not. This is something you have to deal with. The other thing is folks don't understand taxes are a year round project. If you're doing it right, if you're, if you're keeping your risk low and keeping your savings high, you're dealing with taxes all year long, not just at filing time, not just handing everything off to someone to prepare or getting it to self for you to prepare on TurboTax or whatever at filing time. Taxes are a year round project if done right. And among, especially in the heart centered community, uh, you know, and, and uh, solopreneurs, small business owners, lots of gaps in tax knowledge. And that gap means that you're often blindly trusting someone else, blindly trusting a computer program. Again, when I worked for the state, if I had a nickel for every time someone said, but, but I filled out the return the way TurboTax told me to, or I filled it out the way my accountant told me to, well, they were wrong. TurboTax was wrong, your accountant was wrong, and you're still subject to the tax and any penalties. It's, you know, that's just the way it works. Um, so you have, with that knowledge gap, you're blindly trusting folks, uh, and that knowledge gap is, is very likely costing you money and putting you at risk, especially if you're not getting, let's say you do have a good tax accountant who you really can trust, who's giving you really good advice. Are you on the phone with them every day? Getting advice on taxes? Probably not, that would be very expensive, right? <clears throat> So this is why I have Tax Law Made Easy, my program that specializes in education and empowerment in the tax law. And so at the end of the five weeks, here are the kind of goals we have here. It's a five week group program. I want you to save money, but not just save money, do it with confidence and integrity. Like I said, I used to prosecute tax cheats, tax evaders, abusive tax shelter types. I could teach you how to save money illegally. I'm not gonna do that. Okay, I'm gonna teach you how to save money, but to do it right way with confidence and integrity to make sure that you're not paying any more than you have to in taxes. So you get to keep more of your hard earned money and you can do it the right way and not have to worry about getting in trouble or getting caught or anything because you're not doing anything wrong. Learn to protect your wealth and your business uh, with, you know, with tax knowledge, but you know, not just knowledge, but an empowered sort of knowledge because we're gonna get into some real fundamental empowering knowledge on this. So you really understand how the system works, how the puzzle is put together. Uh, tax planning, it's, it's one of the most important wealth building and business building tools out there, but it's a very overlooked tool. Uh, the very wealthy, the big businesses, they are not overlooking this tool. They're using their empowered tax knowledge to build wealth and build their businesses. It's one of the most important tools you have out there. We're gonna reduce your audit risk, but also giving you confidence that you can handle an audit uh, if it happens. I might even say when it happens, because sooner or later, everybody gets audited. And the question I have for you is, you know, how are you gonna handle that audit if and when it happens? Uh, when you get that letter in the mail, you're gonna have the sweaty palms, uh, the heart palpitations, the, your throat gonna get tight, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? Or are you gonna get that envelope and look at it like I do? Which is, oh man, well this sucks. Uh, it's a pain in the ass. I'd rather not have to deal with it because I have other things I could do with my time, but I'm not worried. There's nothing to worry about because I've done everything right. I'm confident in how I've done it and I know how to talk to the auditor. I know how to deal with this. That's more of the attitude that, that I want you to be able to have. Really importantly, give you that tax knowledge that helps you make confident business decisions every day. Literally every business decision you make has tax consequences, every single one. And are you taking those consequences into account when you make your business decisions, when you decide uh, how, this, how you're gonna work with this client? How is this expense gonna be treated? Are you gonna buy this or not buy this? Are you gonna do this expense or not? How are you gonna treat this income that just came in? How are you gonna account for it? Literally everything you do in your business every day has a tax consequence of one sort or another to it. And if you're not accounting for that, then you're not optimizing those business decisions in terms of wealth building and business building and tax savings. That needs to be one of the things you're taking account of. That's why I say, even if you have the best, most trusted, wonderful heart-centered accountant in the world, are you getting them on the phone every day to say, how do I treat this little thing right now? Probably not, because you're gonna pay them more than you would save on it. So I want you guys to get empowered to make those decisions, to know what the consequences are and take that into account literally every time. For me, every business decision I make, I'm thinking of how's this gonna affect me come tax time. 
I want you to know whether your tax preparer is truly acting in your best interest. Now, if you have a preparer you like, I'm not saying that they're bad. I don't know your tax preparer, your accountant. I don't know what they're doing. Okay, They may be acting in your best interest, and that's great, but I want you to be able to know that. I want you to be able to know, hey, is this person that I want to keep on or do I want to get someone else? Because it turns out that they're not really giving me all the best advice or maybe they're being lazy with it or they're not telling me the whole picture. Uh, and I want you to be able to rat, relax and sleep well at night. This is a big thing too. Sleep like a kitten when you're dealing with your taxes. Have that sort of confidence, uh, you know, be able to sleep well and save money. I mean, I've, you know, I've had some folks come to me uh, to help with their audits that if they had been through a program like mine, my gosh, the money and trouble and heartache it could have saved them. Uh, a client came to me with a, they're getting audited, the IRS wanted $30,000 from them. It turns out it was a relatively simple error on their return. That something got double counted, in a couple places, IRS wanted $30,000 from them. I was able to get that bill down to nothing, so they didn't know anything, right? But if they had been through my program and knew how the puzzle pieces fit together, they wouldn't have made that mistake in the first place, wouldn't have gotten the mill, wouldn't have had to come to me and pay me my hourly rate to figure it out, more importantly. So yeah, I got the bill down to nothing, I got the IRS to back off, but in the meantime, this person paid me 500 bucks an hour to deal with it. They could have saved all that money if they had been through a program like this. Another recent client got a bill from an auditor for over $45,000. Uh, it turned out that auditor was just whacked out of their mind. I don't know what was going on. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with the client's return was messed up. The return was a huge mess. And so in a sense, I, in a sense, I couldn't blame the auditor because they were looking at a hugely messy return. But in another sense, uh, if the auditor weren't I don't know, as lazy as they were maybe, some of this stuff they could have figured out simply and realized it shouldn't have been such a big bill. Uh, but again, you know, my client didn't know that their preparer put together a huge messy return. They didn't know whether this was the right preparer for them. They didn't know how to plan and set up their business, you know, right through the whole year leading up to it. So they get this $45,000 tax bill. I got that bill down to $2,500, including interest and a little penalty and everything. It turns out they owed a little bit. There were a couple of expenses they weren't allowed to deduct. Fine, we concede that. Not allowed to deduct it, you're not allowed to, great. But from 45,000 down to 2,500, but in the meantime, again, this client paid me $500 an hour to deal with that. So that's a huge expense they didn't need to have. It's better if you have this kind of empowered tax knowledge and you're getting this stuff as right as you can up front, not just waiting till tax time and then waiting till something goes wrong and paying an attorney like me uh, an outrageous hourly rate uh, that I charge because that's what attorneys charge where I'm from to get it fixed. So we have over the five weeks, a ton of video learning modules and we really go through some fundamental stuff because this is really, this is not just about teaching how to fill out forms and do math. This is about teaching you how the tax system actually works. I'm going to teach you things in this program that quite frankly, your tax preparer probably doesn't know. Because uh, tax attorneys for the government, like I said, are educated at a, in a much different way from accountants and tax preparers at a much deeper level and much more fundamental level. And this is my chance to give back and impart some of that fundamental knowledge from you so that you understand the whole puzzle picture so you really know what you're doing when you're looking at the returns. They're gonna make sense because you understand how the whole system works. You're gonna understand how the whole thing works when you're planning because you know what all these terms mean. So we're gonna talk about what is income, which seems like a funny question, but that turns out to be a more complex question than you might think. And it's the fundamental question from which the entire rest of the income tax law derives. If you don't start from that question, none of the rest of it makes any sense. And too many people when they're teaching taxes nowadays, they skip this question. A lot of places you can go to learn taxes and stuff, they skip this question, which is always fascinating to me because you skip this question, you get everything else wrong. And then what do you get to deduct from it? What's the difference between your personal and business expenses? What can you deduct personally? What can you deduct in your business? And knowing where to deduct it in the right place. One of the biggest sources of trouble for people is not understanding the real difference between what's personal and what's business. Uh, terms like capital versus ordinary expenses and income, passes versus active. These are, these are terms of art in the tax law that in the personal service industry for a lot of solopreneurs, a lot of small businesses, these are very key terms that, that hugely affect how you're going to run your business, not just how you're going to file at the end of the year. And if you don't understand what these terms are, then you make those mistakes during the year 
And then come tax filing time, you're stuck with the consequences of the decisions you've already made. Understanding uh, different business structures and how the tax consequence is different. Do you have the right entity? Do you need multiple entities? How do you need to set it up to take advantage best to those business structures? Again, the answer is it depends because it depends on your circumstances. The structure that works right for me may not work for you or may not work for my buddy Fred or my, you know, my friend Alice. It's going to be different from all of us. But until you understand how those tax consequences work, you can't make that sort of empowered choice. Learn to calculate your net operating loss and your qualified business income deduction. For, for folks in the U.S. especially, these are very hot topics right now because the laws are changing on this. Huge savings opportunities here for small business owner. Huge chance to save a ton of money on your taxes if you understand how these concepts work. Uh, you're going to learn a lot more tax myths. I went over a few tax zombies today. You're going to learn over the course of this program that there are a lot of other tax myths that you may not have realized you're missed. Things that you were like, you're going to go through the program and think, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I thought that the tax worked some, I thought it worked a completely different way. And I thought everybody knew that. It turns out it's not the way it worked at all. Decide whether you really need or want a tax preparer. I happen to think all of you guys are perfectly capable of doing your own taxes. Now you may not want to, which I get. Uh, I'm obviously able to do my taxes. This is what I do. That doesn't mean I like it. It's a pain. I don't enjoy sitting down and filling out the forms any more than anybody else does. But I want you to be able to make an empowered choice. I don't want you to get to filing time and just have to blindly think, well, shoot, I need someone to do this and I have to trust whoever I find. The whole point here is not me telling you what to do. It's me giving you options and knowledge and fundamentals. So you're making an empowered choice on what to do. So you know what's best to save money for you because what saves money for you is not going to be the same thing that saves money for me. Your audit risk is different from my audit risk. So you have to be able to make that empowered choice and just giving your stuff to your tax preparer at the end of the year is not how you do that. And so if you do want a tax preparer, you're gonna have a much better idea to know who to trust. How do I trust someone? How do I know if this is the right one for me or should I keep shopping around? And then I'm going to impart my inside knowledge of the audit system. 18 years I spent in the government auditing taxpayers, little taxpayers, medium taxpayers, big taxpayers, giant taxpayers, you name it, corporate, personal, right? This is where you get to certainly see how that you, we're going to pull back the curtain, right? We're going to pull back the curtain. You see how that inside knowledge works, how the audit system works. So again, uh, not if, but when you get that letter, because sooner or later, everybody gets it. It's rolling the dice and sooner or later, your number comes up. When you get that letter, I want you to be able to look at it and say, oh man, what a pain in the ass. But you know what? It's fine. I know how to deal with this. It's cool. I haven't done anything wrong. I can support everything I've done and I know how to deal with the auditor. I know how the system works. So it's cool. We'll get through it and we'll be fine. So <clears throat> I know that's a huge pool of knowledge, kind of like I try to pack a lot of content and Q&A time into my webinars. I pack a lot of content into my programs too. So you get a lot of access to help. There's all the video learning modules, plus the, the slides, the worksheets, the exercises to help the material sink in, get you really implementing it. If you're not implementing it, it's a waste of your time, quite frankly. You have to do something about it if you want to save the money and reduce your risk. Uh, the Facebook group where you can ask questions anytime. Uh, you know, I have a public Facebook group, but I have the one that's also just reserved for the paying uh, folks in the programs where we can go through this stuff anytime. Uh, a huge part of the value of the program, the live Q&A calls. It's a five-week program, so you'll get access to at least five weekly live Q&A calls on Zoom. We're going to do additional instruction on important points that come up. And quite frankly, I stay on these calls as long as it takes to answer everybody's questions. You should look at my calendar. Uh, when I, well, my calendar, I block off four hours for these calls. That doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to use four hours, but sometimes I have because I don't cut you short. If you guys have four hours worth of questions, I'm going to give you four hours worth of answers because this is hard stuff. I get it. There's a lot here. And if you need help, if you need some hand holding, I'm going to jump in that pool. I'm going to hold your hand and we're going to swim through it together. So that's a huge part of the value of the program. You get access to me for as long as it takes on the Q&A calls to get all of your questions answered on this stuff. I do not skimp on that time. For me, running the Q&A calls on my programs it is one of the most enjoyable parts of my business, quite frankly, because I just love the service. I love the helping people. My whole point here is helping. I've seen the heartbreak that comes from people making mistakes that cost them a lot of money that were easily avoidable. I didn't want to see that heartbreak anymore. I want to do something about it. And email access to me during the course of the program. 
uh, some folks, and I get totally, I totally get why you may have questions sometimes that you don't want to talk about in front of everyone else on Zoom, no problem. You can email them to me. You could also email me questions if you know you can't make a particular call. We make sure it get answered on the call. That way everybody benefits from your question. You're adding value for the program because if you have a question, it's very likely everybody else has the same question. So when you sign up, you get instant access to all the online instructional content and vi videos and worksheets. That stuff is all, all already up. Uh, anybody who signs up anytime gets instant access to all that. I get some folks who want to get in there and get a head start. So I don't drip the content out. You can go through it at your own pace. You can go through it slowly. You can go through it fast. Whatever pace works for you, which is why I just put all the content up. You get instant access to all that when you sign up. And you get access to the next set of live Q&A calls. And right now, the next set of live Q&A calls are scheduled for September 10th. Uh, Thursday, September 10th uh, is the is the tentative time. It looks like we're going to stick to that for now um, for the next set of live weekly Q&A calls. You'll get at least five Q&A calls. I will say um, I can't promise I will throw in bonus calls. I often do throw in at least a bonus call because uh, I like to make sure that people who can't make the regular times get another chance, you know, so we'll see. But you'll get at least five live Q&A calls. I don't like to give speech, big speeches about the value of my programs. Um, my legal rate runs from $500 to $600 an hour for, for whatever that's worth. You can think of that. The value for this program is, is it's worth it. It's whatever it's going to be for you. Quite frankly, um, I think the amount of money you're going to save in taxes, or even if you get in the program and figure out, wow, my taxes are optimized. I'm doing great. The peace of mind you're going to get, to me, that's pretty priceless. Uh, but, you know, the tax savings that you get year after year often makes programs like this pay for itself. But my passion really is avoiding the heartbreak that comes with, uh, you know, this knowledge gap on the legal and tax side of business. I've seen businesses get shut down because they didn't understand the law. I've seen people get hit with huge tax bills that they actually owed because they didn't understand the tax law. It's awful. I don't like seeing that happen. So I'm not going to give you this whole speech where the, the program's worth $88,000 when I'm going to sell it to you for 97 cents or something like that. I mean, the, the value of the program, I think, is pretty self-evident, but it's going to be different for everybody. Uh, and there is that huge tax gap in knowledge, especially amongst small business owners, solopreneurs, the heart center business owners, and it's costing people money and getting them in trouble. Uh, so, to, in order to make it uh, as accessible as possible and make a big difference in the community, um, the program's price is $4.97, which is basically the cost of one hour of my time, but you get me for four weeks. Uh, but during this time, things are a little bit crazy right now. I know a lot of folks, our income is down, things are uncertain. Uh, it's just a nutty time. Uh, but it's also a good time to be using, you know, this time during the pandemic as it keeps dragging on to educate ourselves, to get empowered in this stuff. And so you guys can register for half price. So right now it's 247 to get in to this next run coming up that starts uh, September, uh, September t uh, 10th. So basically half, half the normal price. Uh, and so it's, there's actually, there's 19 educational videos in there plus the slides and worksheets. Now don't worry, it's not 19 hours of videos. Uh, some people will do like five videos, but each one's two hours long. I prefer to do lots of little videos. So I break them out into little bite-sized chunks. So you can think like, oh, well, I'm, I'm making this sort of decision today and I'm not sure what tax consequence that might have. So you can go to that specific video and watch that 10 minute chunk and get the information you need. A lot of feedback I get from folks who go through my programs is they prefer it this way. Uh, they seem to prefer, uh, they've been through programs where you have a few five or six super long videos. They like my style where I give you lots of videos that are breaking down into 10 or 15 minute segments. So you can get in, get the information you need on that specific subject when you have a few minutes and then apply it right away. You get the five weeks of access to the live Q&A calls where I really do stay on as long as it takes to answer your questions and the access through email and Facebook. So that's for 247, which quite frankly, uh, you know, this is why I don't give the big speech about the value of the program. I think quite frankly, that's that price speaks for itself. Uh, <laughs> even a very small amount of tax savings will make this program pay for itself many, many, many times over, even if you only learn a little bit in it to save a little bit of taxes or get yourself out of an audit or get that audit bill lowered. And for a lot of you, uh, you know, again, it depends. I can't say for sure, I don't know your circumstances, but for a lot of you, the cost of the program is tax deductible too, which lowers your real, your real world economic costs for the program. So to enroll, go to taxlawmadeeasy.com 
So that's taxlawmadeeasy.com. And at checkout, use the coupon code FALLTAX. And I will throw that in the chat as well for you guys. Uh, oh, it looks like, Chris, you had a question. I just saw that. You can probably write off the program. Yes, for a lot of you, especially if you're small business owners and you're going to be using this to optimize your small business taxes and build your business, this is almost certainly a write-off for most of you. Again, I can't say for sure. I don't know your circumstances. Uh, but if I were getting this program, for me, I would be writing it off. So taxlawmadeeasy.com. Use the coupon code FALLTAX to get in for your half price for 247. dollars 